Okay, good. So I will uh, I will get started. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you, wherever you're from. Uh, just just some quick introductions. I'm uh, Jay Cohen. So I'm the president of Odla, um, and I'm very pleased to present this presentation this morning, and also pleased to uh, to represent my Odla uh, colleagues. The executive team will be joining as we as we go. Um, I'd like to start this morning um, by really acknowledging. Uh, the tradi traditional owners of the land in which I am based, um, the Wurundjeri people, uh, I would like to recognise uh, that Indigenous Australians uh, have an ongoing connection with the land and indeed the wider Australian society. Um, so I would like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging, um, and also pay my respects to any uh, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Island uh, people that are with us today. So just really briefly before I hand over to, to Rob, uh, uh, Odla is a professional association with a uh, connection obviously with the, uh, with the with the journal, with the Distance Education Journal and Som's here today as the editor. Um, and Rob, of course, as a, uh, as a contributor to the journal. Um, but the Odla part of the uh, association is uh, really for educators, instructional designers and researchers uh, from across Australia and overseas to really uh, look at advancing research and practice and supporting educators uh, more broadly in the distance education space. Um, the ODLA really is about connecting professionals in order to share experiences and share information. Um, and the, really the, the three key aims for ODLA are around um, advancing research and practice, uh, continual engagement and support for, for the community more broadly, um, and really, you know, trying to be the, uh, the the community or the distance education community association of choice. Um, so if you are not an Odla member uh, and you would like to know more about Odla, then by all means, please reach out. Um, today, a great pleasure in, uh, in welcoming Rob, uh, who is the uh, assistant uh, professor at of education technology at the School of Teaching and Learning, the University of Florida. Uh, Rob's research really is about analysing online learning environments, uh, particularly focusing on, uh, on MOOC environments. Uh, he's interested in learning analytics and using learning analytics to ensure learning environments um, offer critical thinking and engagement at all levels in the same way that a face-to-face -face instruction would. Um, so today's webinar is really, again, built around uh, Rob's uh, paper, uh, which is um, in the journal. Um, and it really looks at the, the, the challenges associated with the, the, um, the global pandemic and the shift in instructional responsibilities as a result of that, uh, of, of the pandemic, particularly, you know, parents becoming uh, instructors for their children. Um, and we've all done various parts of that over the, the last few years. So the transition has created several examples of hordagogy. Um, and really, that's what the essence of Rob's uh, discussion today. Uh, and so without further ado, I will hand over to Rob. Uh, very much looking forward to your presentation, Rob. Jay, thank you so much. Welcome to everyone. Thank you for that lovely introduction. So um, I have shared my slides. A um, couple little housekeeping things. Um, as many of you know, who've been on Zoom, Sometimes it's when you're sharing your screen, it's sometimes hard to kind of monitor the chat. So please feel free as the presentation is going on. If you have any questions, add them to the chat. Uh, Jay's going to sort of help me monitor that um, and sort of get my attention uh, if, if I happen to miss, miss something with that. So uh, again, uh, this is a presentation that is going to be about the paper that I wrote that was in the Distance Education Journal in 2020. Uh, it, the title of that paper was Developing Lifelong Learning with Edagogy, uh, Context, Critiques, and Challenges. Um, I don't know how to pronounce edagogy or ketagogy or however you want to pronounce it. So uh, this is one of those things where when you write it, you don't have to say it. So you may hear me pronounce it different ways, but this is what, what we talk about. So a little bit of introduction about who I am. So uh, I'm currently an assistant professor of educational technology in the School of Teaching and Learning at the University of Florida. Uh, pre, I just started there. Uh, two years prior, I was uh, an assistant professor at Old Dominion University. I'm also a faculty um, in the Institutes for Advanced Learning Technologies, we call it IALT. 
and I'm also the director of the ID8 lab. And the lab is located, uh, logos to the right on your screen. And that ID8 stands for Investigating Digital Ecologies Advanced Transformative Education Research. So that's the work that I do. Um, Jay sort of touched on it. Um, I'm really interested in trying to figure out what I like to call the black box of online learning. So, so much of our online learning is in learning management systems. There's so much information being tracked, but there's so much stuff we don't know about what's happening. So I'm interested in trying to figure that out and seeing how we can better inform our practice. So since this is an international webinar, uh, I thought it'd be interesting to sort of see where everyone is currently located right now. So if you go on your, open up another tab or go on your phone and go to pollev.com slash ufrob, you will see a poll that will allow you to literally click on your screen with either your mouse, if you're on your computer or your finger, and approximate where you're located right now, just so we can kind of get a visual depiction of everything. Hopefully this, hopefully everyone fits on the map. And I've just added that uh, link, Rob, uh, to the chat, so people should be able to click right. through or cut and paste it from there. Thanks. Okay. Someone's in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is this is definitely a very far reaching webinar. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, cool. Well, I am glad everyone's able to join and that's that's the power of technology, right? That we're able to kind of bring people on literally two different sides of the world are, are joining us together right now. So, and, and we're gonna come back to this as, as we get into our discussion. And along those lines, still in the same place, polev.com slash UFROB, I'm curious about why did you register for this webinar? Are you curious about pedagogy? Are you an instructor interested in integrating it? You've heard of it, but have questions, not really sure why you're here. You're just looking forward to learning. Okay, so it looks like the majority of the attendees have heard of it, but have some questions. So what I'm hoping is that over the next 35, 45 minutes, I'll be able to answer some of those questions or you'll be able to uh, add those to the chat and we, and we can talk about that. And, and that's a good segue into the, to the next slide. For those of you who have questions, are there any initial questions that you want to ask? Um, you can either type them in, um, uh, pull out, you can use your, uh, you can unmute yourself, or you can use the Zoom chat, whichever you prefer, but just want to take a brief pause to see if there's any questions initially. All right, well, we will move along, but we'll have some, okay. I think some people have, uh, are, are seeing some of my future slides. We will definitely talk about what my definition is, or more importantly, um, and we'll talk about this in a second, this is, this is a systematic review that was done. So it's really, what, what does the literature tell us? Okay. Okay. 
These are all great questions. So we will move along. I think we're gonna answer a couple of these questions uh, over the course of the, uh, over the next 35 minutes, but we'll come back to this slide. So you'll have additional um, opportunities to ask questions and we'll, we'll see if these questions still, still remain as, as we move along. So I wanted to talk about the methods. So one of the things that's really important is to talk about what is and what isn't pedagogy, right? So first, let's talk about what it is. So it is a term that was coined by Hayes and Kenyon in 2000. It's sometimes called self-directed learning, self, sorry, self-determined learning. And it's a learner-centered instructional strategy or approach. But here's what it is not. To be clear, it is not a learning theory such as constructivism or behaviorism. And also, it's a really important point is that it's a, not a one-size-fits-all instructional approach. So I want to talk briefly about the process that I used in, in forming this paper and where the information is coming from for this talk. So what I did is I, I conducted a systematic review to look at the peer-reviewed articles that were published from 2000 when pedagogy was first coined to 2019. And I answered two questions. The first question is, what are the assumptions and premises of pedagogy? The second one was, what educational contexts have adapted pedagogical approaches? And for those that haven't seen, this is the, this is the full citation that was in a distance education, uh, it was in the 2020 edition, the uh, 41st volume, and the third issue. So I want to briefly talk about the article selection process. So my initial search pulled about 159 articles that reference pedagogy between 2000 and 2019. But after going through um, and actually doing a little bit of a deeper dive, I was able to exclude a, a fair number of them. Um, some, of, some of them were not peer reviewed, some of them were conference papers, some of them were dissertations, and ultimately that got down to about 53 papers. One of the things and what makes this a, a unique systematic review, this is actually a request from the reviewers for distance education, is that distance education is a top tier journal. So the reviewers wanted me to make sure that the articles that I was referencing were of the equal quality of distance education. So in order to do that, I had to go back through and I filtered out to make sure every journal article that I was using was at least a Q1 or a Q2 journal and was listed with a, a what had a, had a rating, had an impact factor. So once I did that, that narrowed, narrowed it down. So ultimately there's 33 articles that fit all these criteria that appeared in a top tier journal and were peer reviewed and talked about pedagogy. So I wanna talk about answering research question number one, which is about the assumptions and premises of pedagogy. So one of the first things, one of the first themes that came out was that it's the emergent instructional approach. I, I, I wanna to continue to stress that this is not a learning theory. This is, we're, I'm not equating pedagogy at the same level of behaviorism or other things. It's, a, it's an instructional approach. One of the questions that was asked is like, why do we need this? Um, I believe as instructional designers, instructors, educators, we're always better instructors the more tools we have in our toolbox, right? So pedagogy is just another tool to have at our disposal for us to ensure that we're, we're really teaching and reaching our students. So one of the things that came out, and I put the citations of which articles reference these different concepts, but one of the concepts that came out is that pedagogy really focuses on skill development. We're not simply looking at someone passing a test, we're looking at those real workplace skills that are gonna have transferable abilities. Another thing about it is not time bound. So with one of the concepts of pedagogy is that it's very flexible. The learner gets a lot of control, which means it may not be constrained to, I, the class started September 5th and ends October 25th. S students kind of come and go in a, in a, in a pedagogical approach. That being said, one of the things, and we don't talk about learning styles, you know, that's, that's a myth, but we talk about learning preferences, right? And within any classroom, there's gonna be multiple learning preferences and a pedagogical approach can allow you to support those different preferences, allowing some students to go further ahead, go at a different pace than others and not having to go lockstep with everybody else. It's all about that flexibility. And that's kind of keys into this last point is that if the learners are 
more engaged in the learning process, they're going to be able to continue to stay in it. They're going to have higher levels of persistence, and they're ultimately going to have greater achievement gains because they're personally invested in it. So think about all the times when you had to learn something that was to benefit you. You spent a lot more time in it, when, say, when someone told you to do something, right? When you said, I want to learn how to fix this faucet, you're really motivated to do that, right? So that's, that's what this is talking about, being engaged in that learning process by going on YouTube or wherever else you need to go for that. Another thing that's really important, and it's not a coincidence that I've used, I've already been using Poll Everywhere. We're doing a inter, essentially an international webinar right now. Everyone's uh, watching from across different time zones, different areas of the world. Technology is a key part. So one of the things that's really important to understand is that there's a symbiotic relationship between technology and pedagogy. And uh, Blaschke even comments that what the keys to pedagogy are those Web 2.0 technologies, that social media, that ability for learners to become content creators. Um, so it's really important and critical to understand how technology can be used. So we've already seen some uh, demonstrations of that by using things such as Pull Everywhere, even in this webinar. And that technology can be supportive of self-determined learning. So I think Sam could see my next slide because my next slide is about the connection between humanism and constructivism as it relates to Hedegaard. So there's two kind of con uh, concepts with that. So from the humanistic standpoint, the learner is central to the educational process. And that's where that self-determined learning comes in. So some great examples of that are a massive open online course, right? Or lynda.com or LinkedIn learning, I think it's called now, right? I want to learn something. So I go out and try to figure out a way to learn that and use those tools, use that technology. So that's kind of where that humanistic perspective comes in. And then there's the constructivist side of things, right? Because uh, people are constructing their version of reality using their past experiences. And even if you look at this background picture, it really kind of encompasses both of those concepts, right? You have uh, two daughters working with their father to do some type of science experiment project, right? So it's a blending of that humanistic and, construct and constructivist because the, the, the daughters want to learn, the father's teaching and the, the Father, he's not using an instruction manual, he's using his past experience, and together they're forming that. That uh, second question, Rob, from Som, is uh, is technology essential to hodagogy? Yes, I, I would say it's, it's, I would say it's, it's critically, it, it, yes, I would say it's essential because you need, um, in order to truly give learners that ability to have that control, technology is going to play a factor in it. As we think of different examples, there we will be hard pressed to come up with an example that, that's demonstrated in pedagogy that didn't use some role of technology, whether that is what we saw with what was happening during with, with the first COVID-19 lockdowns, where uh, we were seeing parents were struggling with their math homework with their kids, and they went to online discussion forums, or they posted on social media, or they were watched, they went to Khan Academy or we see the increase in MOOCs, right? Because learners want to get on and learn different skills. So I think I think I, I would see technology as being an essential part. And like I said, it's a symbiotic relationship. They kind of go hand in hand and they, they, they benefit from each, they both help each other. So hopefully that answers your question, Sam. Happy to go a little bit deeper with that. So one of the concepts that came up in, in, these, in these premises is what you may have heard is a continuum. And it's, it's it, a Blaschke and Cannon called it the, the pedagogy, andragogy, pedagogy continuum, right? So there's a graphic that exists um, that's got like a triangle. And I, as I was going through and doing the reading, I, I struggled to understand and conceptualize that. And as I, as I really looked at these articles, I thought that graphic wasn't the most helpful so I reconceptualized that continuum. And I want to give an example and sort of walk you through it. So I want to situate this in a learning management system because that's something many of us are familiar with, with, with either as an instructor or as a student. So when we think about this continuum, I want to, I want to focus on this concept of learner autonomy, okay? So the first one, the first part of continuum is pedagogy, right? So if we look at with a learning management system, we look at learner autonomy, 
this is going to be a situation where uh, it's a traditional class that we have in our learning management system. The instructor has said what time the semester starts on, on August 15th. The semester ends December 15th. The instructor determines what the students work on each week. Uh, the modules are only released on that week. So we're on week one. That's the only modules you can see. Week two opens on Sunday. I'm an instructor. I will open it, right? So it's very structured. Um, there's very little learner autonomy. The next one is andragogy, right? So there's a little bit more learner autonomy here, right? So carrying forward with the, with the learning management system, in this course now, what ends up happening is the instructor still structures the class. We still have a start and end date, but all the course material is open at one time. So the students are able to move about as they want to. They can look ahead. They can move a little bit faster or they can stay on pace. But the instructor is still involved, so they're not completely on their own. One of these examples is uh, discussion forums. So an example of this with this learner autonomy would be when an instructor says, uh, everyone posts their discussion posts on Thursday and make your replies by Sunday. You, you have a little bit of flexibility when you make your initial posts. You have some flexibility when you do your replies, but you're still kind of structured, right? So that's kind of that, trying to balance that learner autonomy and making sure learners understand where they need to be. And then the final one is pedagogy. So this one is going to have the most learner autonomy. This is going to be like a self-paced class. This is going to be a course that has no, no specific deadlines. It's basically, hey, go in here and do what you want to do. Uh, it's a great example of like a, a MOOC, right? The self-paced MOOCs where we see learners will, sign, will go in because they just want to learn this one skill. Once they've accessed that content, they, they leave. They don't continue. They don't persist. So that's kind of how this continuum could look if we look at it from a perspective of um, learner autonomy. And just checking the questions. Um, so, yes, yeah, Sam's other question is self-regulation is a critical part of pedagogy. And I think it really you can really understand it if you look at it from the concept of learner autonomy. Right. Because you have to you have to have some control. Um, and this is actually one of the things that really is a challenge with pedagogy. Right. Because you have this tension because um, while on the surface, a student may say, I want to have control over my own learning. If they don't know how to self-regulate and how to self-monitor their work, how can they have that responsibility? So we, we, get this, we get this weird tension where instructors want to say, I want to be learner-centered, right? But I can't let the students just dictate what they're doing because they'll never get any work done, right? So we got to figure this out. So it, it becomes a challenge. So it's, it's the pros and cons, right? And, and that's why um, pedagogy can be helpful but as we'll talk about, that's why I say it's not a one size fits all, right? Because it's just, it's simply not gonna work for every learner, but no instructional approach works for every learner. So we shouldn't apply that, that concept. So returning back to the question. So we've answered the question about my definition of pedagogy. We've talked a bit about why we need it. Uh, we're gonna talk about, uh, how to implement the principles in practice. It's actually the answer to research question number two. Um, difference between pedagogy and autonomous learning. I, there, there's, a, there's a lot of overlaps. Um, I think that when someone has designed an autonomous learning environment, they're likely integrating pedagogical principles within that learning environment. So I don't see them as being, I wouldn't put them up uh, in competition. I will put them more as uh, in support, if that makes sense. Um, so, so I think that you would, I think if we analyze what an autonomous learning environment looks like, we're gonna see a lot of overlap with what those principles are with, with, with pedagogy principles. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that pedagogy is new. Um, one of the things that was interesting and, and, and full disclosure, where this all came up is uh, when I was working on my dissertation, I was evaluating different learning theories and I was looking at the potential of what theories could I use to understand mass local online courses what my dissertation was on. So I ultimately did a lot of research on pedagogy, even though it's not a learning theory, but I saw there was a quite a bit of an overlap between that self-regulation and that self-directed learning is inherent within MOOCs. So that's kind of where I started looking at it. One of the things I do think that's interesting, um, 
is even though pedagogy was, you know, coined in 2000, we're still seeing a lot of work being done. It's still timely. It's still an instructional approach that's being used. Even when I was doing a systematic review, there was a good distribution of articles uh, in 2019, 2011. Uh, so we're, uh, 2021 rather. Um, so we're still seeing it being applicable. Um, if anything, I actually think that COVID-19 has actually identified why things such as pedagogy are that much more important, right? Because pedagogy is specifically looking at how do we foster support self-directed learning? And when we went into lockdown across the world, so much of us had to do some type of self-directed learning, right? Whether it was literally learning how to bake a cake, doing bread baking, how to do math problems that we haven't looked at in 20 years because we got to support our children, uh, many of us, many parents became teachers all of a sudden because they're having to help their, their, their children navigate the instructional context. So I think pedagogy, if anything, is, has been, is an instructional approach that we really should be paying attention to as we move forward. So that segues in, I want to talk a bit about some of the learning environments and context that emerged from the systematic review. So the one of the ones that came up and was pretty obvious was about the workplace environments. So one of the things about this is that there's a premium on workers that can demonstrate the capability versus competence, right? Employers want someone who can do the job, not just who knows about the job, right? So we're looking for who can actually demonstrate those skills. So pedagogy is something that can help learners do that. One of the things that we're seeing is a concept called prior learning assessments. And what prior learning assessments are, are ways that we're seeing a, a, a merge between workplace life experience and academic credit. So we see that with some of these competency models uh, at, at different universities and also in uh, institutions. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to figure out a way that we can reward that experience of academic credit because sometimes that academic credit itself is tied to mobility within the workplace. And there's definitely an emphasis on informal online learning um, that going back to Sam's question about whether or not technology is essential to pedagogy. Well, that informal online learning is critical in the workplace. Every one of us that has a well, any one of us that has a job has at some point done some type of online learning, whether it's sexual harassment training, whether we're doing IRB training. Like it is very rare that we get training face-to-face -face now, right? Most of our training is some type of e-learning module or uh, online activity, uh, complete this. I mean, even with our HR benefits sometimes, we're not even sitting in the room and talking to an HR specialist, we're watching a video that shows us how to go through that, right? So that's what we're doing on the, on the work side. So there's a need for that, but we're also doing it when we just need to learn anything, right? So how many times have you needed to figure out something in your life and you got on YouTube to do it, right? You know, I'm trying to put together this shelf. Okay, I'm gonna go on YouTube to find a video. I'm trying to figure out, I don't know how to change the knob on this door. I don't know how to fix this. We're on YouTube. My, my, I talk to my father every day and at least five times a week, he's watching some video on YouTube, learning about home improvement stuff. Nothing's broken in this house. Absolutely nothing is broken, but he just loves watching videos. He just, because he just says, I always like to learn. I like watching how-to videos, right? That's an informal online learning. He's demonstrating a self-directedness, right? He's interested in it, so he goes out and seeks and finds that information. Another context we look at, obviously, is higher education. So, again, we see another uh, link here between that capacity and capability and then the application of pedagogical principles. And that happens, and so there is three different types of courses that were specifically a part of the systematic review. There was some journalism classes, enterprise education, and architecture education. These courses were all redesigned for, to use pedagogical principles. And one of the ways they redid this is they reconceptualized the assessments to allow more student-directed learning. So one of the things that we see this for, one of the ways we will see this is, um, let's say, uh, you have to do a final, you have to do a final paper for your class. As an instructor, say they need to do a final project, right? So you could tell all the students to write a 15-page paper, or you could say, okay, 
you got to do a final project. That's the requirement. But you tell me what you want to do. Do you want to do a final paper? Do you want to do a podcast? Do you want to do a, a video? Do you want to do an interview? You give the students multiple options and let them determine how it's going to be done. You can even go one step further and say, okay, you pitch the idea and you tell me how you want me to evaluate, right? You evaluate it for yourself and you tell me what the expectations are. So I've actually done that in, 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 a cla in, class, in classes where I had the students come up with the rubric that they were going to then apply to their own projects. So that's a way that we can kind of incorporate that concept. And again, we keep coming back to it, but that technology can help make those more authentic learning environments. So technology takes different forms, right? I mean, in, in a context, a pencil can be considered technology, right? Depending on how it's used. So we use technology pretty broad, but it's really uh, an opportunity for those authentic, authentic learning environments. And that's something that really emerged from this systematic review. The next area we saw is medical education. And, and, and some of this is like, this makes perfect sense, right? So we think about medical professionals and they have to, by definition, not only stay current on the best practices, but also apply that knowledge to unique situations, right? So they have to know what the new technique is, what the new treatment protocols are, but they also have to look at a patient who may not present with exactly how they read it. They may have to apply it to a, a unique situation. And they really tie into the pedagogical principles because medical professionals learning itself is really driven by those specific feedback and problems of interest, right? A, a patient presents with X problem. I don't know how to solve it. Let me go research how to solve this problem, right? So that's very much the pedagogical approach. And in the systematic review, there was a, there was a paper that talked about how they used a flipped classroom approach specifically with pharmacy and nursing students. So the idea was, uh, the idea was that there were videos that the, the students watched before class that taught them the background information, the core principles to the practice. Maybe it was a video showing them how to, con how to do this medical procedure or diagnose someone. And then they came into class and it was the application of practice, right? They actually practiced those specific skills that they had watched the video for. And that's how they were able to link those two together. Now, again, this is, this is the results of the systematic review that gave these specific examples, but we can all think of other examples in our own context where our flipped learning may work. One of the other things that really came up that was interesting in, in this review and these articles is Let's talk about professional development. And with professional development, there's really this difficult tension between inst institutional needs and faculty needs, right? So the institution will sometimes dictate what type of skills the faculty need to have, right? Um, and there's only so much time faculty have in, in their day to handle their teaching research and other responsibilities. But then like, as we were talking about the online training, if the institution says, I expect you to do these seven online training modules about uh, different, different soft skills, right? You don't have much time to do other things. And then faculty you may want to be like, I want to learn X skill. Where do I have the time for it? We see this a lot with, at the faculty level because that's why so many faculty uh, professional development is usually tied to reduction in teaching load, right? Or it's, hey, if you apply for this, if you propose a research project of your interest, we'll buy you out from a class or you'll get a course release or you could do it over the summer, right? It's because we're, they're trying to navigate that, that tension between the instructional needs and the faculty needs. And a couple recommendations for that that emerged from this review was one, was to really try to leverage social media because social media allows you to create these professional learning networks so while you may not be able to get that uh, hands-on training when you're on your campus, but you can network and, inter and interact with faculty across the world that have your specific interests and get some of that. And one of the recommendations uh, that emerged was this concept of an unconference. Uh, and I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with it, um, but it sometimes it's called an ed camp. And basically actually it's what the background picture is showing. The idea is you get everyone so we've all been to academic conferences where people submit abstracts. 
there, uh, someone's assigned uh, such and such presentation is going to be at 12 o'clock, someone's going to be at 2 o'clock, and you go to specific defined sections, right? So that's the traditional academic conference. Uh, unconference is completely, it's almost the opposite of that. So what ends up happening is you get everyone meets together in the morning, and they literally get a big board, and they come up with the ideas of what they want to talk about. So no one has really, people really haven't prepared information before. They haven't prepared a PowerPoint. They literally just start putting ideas up on the board, right? Everyone who's coming to this conference, this unconference. And then people start grouping things together and then themes start to emerge. And then that's what the conference, that's what the rest of the day is spent doing, right? So you end up with these informal working groups and it allows you to really focus on what your interests are. So you could walk in with, five different interests and it turns out you meet three different people, three different projects, right? So you just kind of move throughout the day. So that's a great way that we can see how those pedagogical principles can be integrated in a way to support the professional development. So we are seeing more of these types of unconferences because it is a little bit freeing um, and also it, it lowers that barrier, right? Because with academic conferences, you gotta have someone reviewing the proposal, you gotta make sure it's worthy. Whereas with this, it's literally, you, you throw up an idea and if someone likes your idea, you can go off in a breakout uh, small room and you can start talking about that. So another area we see, um, and this is one of my personal and my professional uh, research uh, uh, interests. Where's your toy? Sorry. So um, with, with massive online courses, obviously it, it really ties in the head of because enrollments are driven by student interests, right? The students are seeking out these opportunities. They are purposely enrolling in that. Um, what is um, what they are going to do and how they're going to achieve and how they're going to stay in that course? That's also tied to it. But enrollments really are driven by student interest. So um, briefly, there's two types of MOOCs uh, traditionally. So there's a C MOOC, which is a connectivist MOOC, and there's X MOOC. Typically, what the X MOOCs are are the MOOCs that we're familiar with that we see all the time. Typically, an X MOOC is offered by, is backed by a university or institution, right? So we see like a lot of the courses on edX are offered by MIT, Harvard, uh, University of Florida, uh, Indiana University. And those are going to have kind of a defined start and end date. They're going to have an instructor who's going to be facilitating it. Even in the self paced, the instructor has put some content out there and you can kind of pick and choose and move about. But on the flip side, the connectivist MOOCs, which are the ones that are closely related to pedagogical principles, they're called connectivist MOOCs. Um, they're not as prevalent, but it's because they're learner generated content and it's collaborative learning. So these are the MOOCs that are, the learners are really generating that content. Um, and they are the ones that are going to be using social media more and those different learner generated concepts. So I want to take a brief beat here, see if there's any questions. Okay. There's comments. Yeah. Unconference is, unconference is a cool, is a cool, is a cool conference, a cool concept. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a, if it's in a, uh, more of an American thing or an international thing, but it definitely was something that emerged um, from, from the literature. So I wanna talk briefly about some of these critiques and challenges. So one of the biggest challenges, and again, this is also what keeps uh, pedagogy from being a learning theory, um, is that there's a lack of empirical evidence. And one of the big factors with that is that there's not a validated instrument with something like, for instance, like the community of inquiry model, right? That, that's something that's been validated in 2008. We've had countless studies of how it's been applied to different contexts, there's empirical evidence, of the different presences um, and, and, and that. So as we think about this lack of empirical evidence, there's two key questions that come up and, and two key questions that may explain why there's a lack of empirical evidence. The first is, how do we measure development of learner self-efficacy and capability? That's a really hard concept to measure, but those are two key concepts to pedagogy, right? So if we were to create a validated instrument, we'd have to figure out a way to measure this to be able to give it to the students. And that's, a, that's really hard to measure because everyone's gonna be different. It, 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 it presents a problem. And another challenge is how do we measure the development of the metacognitive skills? 
I'm not saying this is not impossible. I'm not saying that others may have done may have done something close, right? But to date, there hasn't been anyone who has been able to link these key questions and pedagogy in a way to create a pedagogical a validated instrument. Um, so these are some of the challenges with that. Another issue that came out from the reading was that there's an issue with assessment, right? There's a challenge rather with assessment. So one of the challenges with assessment is if we're giving learners the ability to kind of have control, right? How do we give them grades in a class, right? How, how do we properly assess their learning? How do we, how do we know what they're doing? So uh, instructors are tasked with doing a formative assessment. The way it, is, it works, at, at least in the, in the American educational system, is we got to give grades. So how do we give a grade if the student gets to determine what their grade is, right? Are the students getting to pick, pick their work? So there's a little bit of attention. I'm not saying it's not impossible, but it's definitely something that we need to consider. Yeah, that yeah. And Jay, it's a tricky yeah. one. Yeah. yeah, it's exactly how do you how do you take these self-selected assessments to learning outcomes, right? And again, that's that that's that tension we talked about before, because how do you respect the learner autonomy, right? But at the same time say we got to have some kind of structure, right? Because as soon as you start imposing this, but then the flip side, as we talked about earlier, to talk about self-regulation, students don't know how to. Students may not know how to self-assess themselves, right? How often have we, that's one of the biggest issues we have with self-reported measures, right? Is that how do we know that students are uh, properly assessing themselves on a, on a, on a scale? So it, it's definitely a, a, a challenge that we have. You can do somewhere so, in between, Rob. You know, you can quite often have a, an assessment choice option. So they could choose, you know, there's still a self-directed learning piece or self-directed piece where they can choose. You know, we did a project when I was at Swinburne exactly that, a, a, like a buffet of assessment tasks that students could choose from that all aligned to the learning outcomes where they still felt like they had control, um, but they couldn't just go, you know, completely rogue. No, that, that's a great, that's a great one. And, no, uh, and one of the suggestions that kind of emerged from this was to really try to leverage e-learning. So again, we're coming right back to technology. So one of the things that we can do with e-learning is we can create ways of students to uh, assess their own knowledge, right? So we can and give them some control. Uh, one of the things I'll, this may be dating myself, but um, I don't know how many of you remember or read those Choose Your Own Adventure books, right? So uh, it was it, the book, the full book is written. I mean, I, I got the book in my hand, but as I get to page four, I'm faced with a decision and I can, what, if I pick option A, I go to page eight. If I pick option uh, B, I go to page six, right? So we can do that kind of things with e-learning and that can potentially give learners that ability, right? So it could be that maybe we design a module and we give them a, a quick knowledge check at the very beginning. And if they score over 80%, they can skip to the end, right? Cause it's like, hey, you, you, you know the content, go ahead and take that final assessment. I'm gonna check you off of having completed this, right? So there, there are some ways that we can do that. I really think technology is a, definitely a way that we can look to do that because it can give us, we, we have a richness that we can do with those modules. Another area that is a challenge is with institutional policies. So the elephant in the room is accreditation, right? That is what the concern is for any higher ed education institution is accreditation. And that's again, where we see that tension, right? Because uh, the accreditation agency does not wanna see a narrative that says, well, in Jay's class, eight of my students did interpretive dance and five students decided they were gonna write a paper. Like they're like, well, how does that relate, right? Well, you can't say, well, my students really wanted to do it, you know? So we have this tension with accreditation and that's also why there's some concern about how we do that. Um, and the biggest, again, we're going back to, to not being a validated instrument, is that so much of our curriculum at least the, uh, uh, internationally or in the United States rather, is about passing tests and standardized, standard, and standardized curriculum, right? So that really hinders and hampers the ability for learners to question what's going on and to be self-determined learners, right? A third grader, 
every third grader in the United States is doing the same basic activities, right? It doesn't matter where they're located. They're all because someone has determined that a third grader needs to be able to do these eight things, right? So they may have slightly different approaches on how to get there, but they pretty much have that. So that, that's not really giving them that opportunity to be self-determined learners. So a solution that I have in a way to kind of manage against that is to use maybe a hybrid approach, right? So we know that we're gonna, we, we have these, con, these constraints, this final grade, this type of things that are needed. So one way around that or to integrate it is to use the pedagogical principles for some of your activities, right? And then you as the instructor assess those activities the students did and assess their final grade, right? So you wouldn't necessarily, it, it'd be a challenge maybe to make the entire course using pedagogical principles, right? Because it would really, it probably wouldn't pass that final part, right? It would be hard to give that final grade. You, you could do it, um, but if you do a more of a hybrid approach, that may be able to do that. Sound that, that that's a great question. I mean, I, I it, it 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 it's that it's that balancing act, right? And 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 that's why my position and and what the literature was showing is that many and, and many of these in all these courses that were redesigned, none of them were redesigned to be a hundred percent pedagogical, right? It was components. It was principles underlying it. Um, it was a it was a way. It was um, it was a way to manage those institutional policies, those assessment issues, giving students some control, but not giving them full reign, right? Um, and, and at least in, in in the higher education context, right? When we're in a MOOC, we're in those informal learning environments. You know, it can it, as many of us know, it could be the wild wild west, right? Um, so they can kind of do what they want to do. But we're we're talking specifically in that in those educational contexts where where they're trying to learn and assess the learning. I mean, so for instance, I'm all for, like we talk about medical education, I'm all for using creative ways to teach the doctors how to do it, but I still kind of want to make sure that doctor passed that medical board exam, right? Because I, I think there's certain things that we should make sure that's still being done, right? Like if, if, there's diff, if there's creative ways from to learn the material and retain it, I'm all for that, right? But um, I still think we do need that standardization. So I, I'm not advocating that we completely let students just dictate everything. Yo, yes, yes, definitely. There needs to be a lot of scaffolding. Um, and, and that's also a challenge, right? Um, because that, this takes a lot of work. So uh, it's a misconception to think that a learner-centered learning environment does not have teacher involvement. I mean, some could argue that a learner-centered environment actually takes more teacher involvement. It may be in the background, right? But in order to make a, a learner-centered environment, it might mean the instructor had to make five different versions of the course to give the choices to the, to the, to the students, right? So learner-centered doesn't mean the instructor's out of it. And, and that's actually uh, some of the arguments against being learner-centered, right? Because it's like, it, it's too much. I can't give them that many options, right? Like I can't give the, I can't, I have 50 students in my class. I can't give them all the option to pick their own final projects. I just can't do that. I, the, the fastest way to, the most efficient way to grade anything is if everyone's under the same rubric, right? So one of the, that's, that's also, that's kind of been one of the, that's one of the pushbacks. But again, it goes back to that hybrid approach, right? It might be a way that, hey, you let them pick one activity that they can do it, but we still have some other constraints. And I think that addresses Psalm's point about not having that un, unbounded openness, right? You got to have a little bit, you got to have some parameters. Oh, learner center environments require a ton of work. Anyone who's taught, uh, anyone who's taught online knows that, I mean, they, they, they've done research that has shown that um, I, I, I think I saw Kieran was on this. I mean, I know she's done some research on this, that developing online learning environment sometimes takes more time than face-to-face -face classes. And, and it's, it's been really interesting with, with COVID with so many faculty suddenly finding out just how hard it was to teach online because there's always, there's been um, some thoughts that teaching online was easier than face-to-face because -face. Oh, I just put my PowerPoints online and students do it. And then you realize like, oh no, it's way more complicated than that, right? 
So it, it takes a lot of time. And some of these are limitations, right? Some of these are other things. I mean, another limitation is we typically teach the way we were taught. That's what we're familiar with, right? We go back, if we get uncomfortable, we go back to the familiar. And most of us were taught in a didactic way, right? So it's very easy for us to naturally go to that when, we, when we're teaching. Yeah, so I'm, exactly. It, th those courses get super complicated. You got multiple pages. You're trying to make that user experience. You're trying to design for multiple people. Um, and it, it, can be a, it can be a challenge. So um, this has been a brief overview uh, at, for everyone. So going back to polev.com slash UFROB, I'm curious now, what's your understanding of pedagogy now? Well, let's see how responses. Well, that is awesome. I need to send this. I need to put this in my annual report. That 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 means I did something right. Yeah, you sure did, Rob. <laughs> so I want to come back and and we've got a we've got a few minutes now. Um, I know for many of you that pedagogy was new. It's a new concept. So um, I know we have very limited time. Uh, this could easily be a three hour presentation or a whole lecture. Um, I wanted to sort of give you the highlights from this review. Um, I think I saw Jay post it. This, this full paper has been published um, that has everything and, and breaks everything down. Um, and you can kind of look at that. I really encourage you to take a look at it. Um, I, I think there's been some really interesting work on that. Um, Happy to answer any other questions. Um, and like I said, you can add them. We're, we're, you can unmute yourself. We have a relatively small group right now, or you can add employee or, or on the Zoom chat, whichever one you prefer. I to find multiple. See, this is it, that learner centered part, right? Giving you multiple opportunities and multiple avenues to use technology to ask the questions. Yeah, Rob, and the, and the comment there from Larissa is a, an interesting one as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see that. Um, yeah, concept-based curriculum. Um, is that is that is that similar? I haven't heard of concept-based. Is that similar to competency-based? Is it an offshoot? No. <laughs> Hi. How are you? Um, no, it's based on the idea is instead of a course dividing the course in topics or themes, you have the concepts, the main concepts that build the essence of the course mm -hmm. and then you give students the the self-determination in order to deepen in each concept and to make the relationships they find and how they connect to previous knowledge that they already have what's the uh and what's the uh what's the topic area that that you've done this in I, I've used it with students in, in a master's degree uh, in innovation, in an innovation, technology and innovation. Okay. Yeah. okay. So every student has their own projects, but the idea okay. of understanding innov innovation in education mm -hmm. was, was the topic, of, was the name of the course. Yeah, that's, that's a great example. And, and one of the things that, that you mentioned innovation, we see that it was journalism, it was enterprise education, architecture education. Um, you see it tends to be in courses that allow for some of that flexibility, right? 
um, it, it may be a challenge to do this and say a, a calculus class or, or something that's got, or, or a biology class, right? Or it's something that's very specific, but with, with courses that kind of have that creativity kind of built into the content area, you could really see some potential. I, I, I see some huge opportunities for pedagogical approaches like with educational technology, right? Because by definition, it's a very open and fluid type of thing. So that's why I think that's, that's a great example, Larissa, and that innovation makes perfect sense about why that would work, right? Because you want to foster that creativity, right? Which is a core, and, and if the students are engaged in that and being creative, it's like it's like a nice little uh, cycle, right? So, so that's a great example. Yeah, I guess uh, innovation is highly unlikely if it's highly constrained. Right. So what this does is the self-determination part or the self-direction part generates the innovation. So these two things couldn't would be, as I said, constrained uh, if they didn't work together. So it's a really good example. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, you're uh, welcome. I'm just mindful of time, uh, just a couple of minutes left. Is there any other broader questions? I know we've addressed questions on along the way. Rob, Rob, can I, uh, Jay, can I make a comment? Please do so. Uh, uh, Rob, uh, thank you very much, man. I uh, appreciate your insights into this and I would love to see your dissertation because I'm sure there's so much, so much depth there. I was in a, a recent presentation by Richard Mayer from uh, USC, I think, um, and um, in, a, in a webinar and he, he was kind of suggesting that we need to be careful about this big picture conceptualizations of, of learning, such as behaviorism, constructivism, and constructionism, and so on and so on. Uh, he, he wasn't a great fan of it. And, and I wanted to take, uh, given your dissertation was so focused on learning theories, if you were to make a comment on, on, on uh, what was uh, the outcome of that kind of study on learning theories, what is your take on uh, these sorts of uh, captions that have been uh, promoted so often and it's changing. I mean, so many more are coming like flipped classrooms and so on and so on. And if you go back, you'll find that all of these terms, or most of them are basically uh, reincarnations of something that we have known before, you know, <laughs> what is new about flip classroom, for example, you know, and video, for example, I mean, okay, you know, we're getting so excited about it. Uh, uh, but we, you know, you go back to the 70s and big media, little media, you know, uh, a little bit shram kind of thing. And you'll see that a lot of it is coming back at us in new forms, you know, old, uh, what, old wine in new bottles kind of things, you know. But, but going back to my question, I wanted your take. I want to see what your take is on when, when all is said and done, what are the core principles of, of, of learning and teaching? Wow. I mean, you're going to drop that question on at the very end. So to be clear, <laughs> for my, what ended up happening as I was originally looking at pedagogy for my uh, as I was working on my dissertation, I ultimately did not use it in my dissertation. I actually used the community of inquiry. Um, but actually, it kind of goes back to that point. It kind of answers it. One of the challenges that we see, it, it's, it's, a, it's an, I hate to reuse it again, but it's that tension again, right? Because so much uh, when we're teaching doc students, we tell doc students that you can't conduct any research unless you can tie it back to one of these theories, so like, that's kind of how we've all, a lot of us have been trained. That's what we're telling our doc students, right? They've got to find something. They've got to connect to behaviorism or constructivism. And that also kind of spurs this constant regurgitation of the same ideas. Um, I, I am not in favor of continuing to come up with new ideas, um, but I do think that there is value in understanding what the underlying concepts are, right? So instead of us focusing on if this is connect, uh, cognitivism or constructivism or properly aligning it, let's look at what those principles are and as it relates to student experience and how we can use to inform and improve how students are engaged in the learning environments, right? So who cares if it actually ends up being pedagogy or constructivism or humanism? Like we don't need to put a label on it so much, but let's focus on the concepts, right? So one of the things as, as, as we're looking at, and I think that kind of keys in to um, some of my final thoughts that, that I put up on the slide as we, as we wrap up, 
the first one is I, I think you got to be strategic about the implementation of the principles, right? So you don't just say I want to be, I just want to, I want to be a, I want to be a devotee to to pedagogy. Think about how those principles, the, the thing, the mantra I always say is technology supports instruction, right? So how can we use these principles, these concepts, this openness to foster the innovation as Larissa was talking about, uh, looking at building community, how can we integrate those principles into our instruction, right? And that I think that's key. Um, we really need to leverage the forces of technology. Technology can do some really powerful things if it's implemented correctly, but it can also do some disastrous things if it's not implemented correctly, right? So we need to be really careful about how we do that. And, 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 number one, and this probably could be the number one thing, communicate with your learners. Find out what it is that they're trying to do, right? Because they may not want that. They may want to be told what to do. I have master's level students right now that completely freak out when I don't give them an explicit exemplar and a rubric and other examples. I mean, like they really want me to guide them through the class and the other students are like, yeah, I'm on week eight. Um, I know we're on week five. I have a question about this assignment, right? So it's the same class and it, it's, it's really about figuring out what those learners need. And then the final thing is I, I really, it, I really wish that we could figure out a way as a community to figure out a way to do some empirical based studies that could validate this learning approach. Um, I think if we could crack that code and figure out how to handle that, that capability demonstration that metacognitive skills, I think there's some real power to that because I think that would unlock a lot of things that would allow for implementation. Thank you, Rob. I am uh, mindful of the time I've lost. A couple yeah. of people have dropped off already because of the time, but look, uh, an incredibly informative and engaging presentation. So uh, yeah, on behalf of everyone here and, uh, and the Odler executive, thank you so much, Rob. Thank you. Did if you there's any questions, time, so? check my email address. Um, and happy to answer other questions. I think I'm have to have a, uh, I'm about to set up a meeting with Sam to, 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 to nerd out on some things. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you. I will, uh, I will call the, uh, the presentation to a close. But again, Rob, thank you so much. And thank you for everyone else for your attendance. Uh, a really great presentation. And I'll stick around for a couple of minutes if anyone else has any questions before they drop off. Thanks so much. Take care, everyone. Beautiful.